This is the May 10th meeting of the Raleigh Conservation Commission. This meeting is hereby called to order under the authority of Massachusetts General Law 131, Section 40, the Town of Raleigh Wetlands, Protection Bylaw, and the Stormwater Management and Erosion Control Bylaw. Notice is given that both a video and an audio recording will be made at this meeting, and the agent will now call attendance. Thank you, Bob Garner. Uh, here. Judy Keyes. Here. Sam Strife. Here. Arthur Page. Yep. Kurt Turner. Here. Howard Vogel. Here. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum present. Okay, well that would bring us to administrative, payroll, and or vendor bills. And I have a lovely selection of both this evening. I would request the payroll be authorized. Mr. Chairman, our hours. using the notice of intent monies to issue, <coughs> issued in order of conditions. Which one is this, do you know? uh, That was the one to the 305 Newburyport Turnpike in Edward Surratt, Prime Realty. Um, I'd like to interrupt right here and just say that uh, one of our people in the audience is Amy Schofield, um, and she is thinking of going to applying for the position uh, to be on the CONCOM, and you work for MWR? Right? Yeah, Boston Water and Sewer. Yep, and uh, she's very familiar with this, and we've had conversations back as far as a year ago, and uh, but she's just here to see how efficient we are. Whatever. Okay. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> well, thank you for your interest. All right, that brings us up to uh, minutes, and uh, what we'll do is we have three sets of minutes to approve. Has everybody had a chance to read and review the April 18, 2017? Mm -hmm. I'd like to call attention that um, based on some comments I received, I'd like to read some slight editing. Okay, please. On the first page, under the status report for Prospect Hill Access Roadway uh, Project, <clears throat> uh, the sentence that starts, appropriate departments were not 
notified about the damage until Monday, April 3rd, and it was subsequently determined that a water department communications failure yes. had caused an overflow of the water storage tank, period. So the word failure is now uh, new to that. And then uh, Going down a sent the next sentence, Taylor and Howard, the engineering firm, working with the town and the contractor, prepared a plan to correct the overflow discharge outlet location to avoid future roadway damage, period. We restructured that to focus on the fact that the location of the outlet is being changed. That, yeah, I thought, I, that seemed to be the main contributing factor to right, the reason uh, that the overflow damage Yeah, road. I got that. Yeah, Kurt, uh, was Every on, wording is very important, I think. On page three of three, these are very minor things under discussions, uh, middle of the page, Bread Street Farm Conservation Area Farming Request. We had not uh, given Mar Mario Marini uh, the title of Mr. No. And the next topic, the Dodge Reservation Project Request, we had not specifically identified the YMCA as the Ipswich Family YMCA and it's Camp Cider Mill, where the basketball court is located. So that's just so small but important. Yes, the, yeah, since we didn't want to leave to people to speculate about which YMCA we were talking about. Um, <clears throat> yeah. All right, do I have a motion to approve as rewritten? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Uh, and that brings us to the September 8, 2015. Everybody have a chance to review that? <clears throat> Give me a second to just check that in case there was any. Uh, yes, there were some uh, slight editorial uh, changes to the very last page, three of three. When we uh, talking about notice of intent for land off West Creek containing the Western Villanova University. Uh, sentence that starts with Agent Bazelak advised that the order of conditions had been draft drafted and inserted to mimic similar projects. Because we've had other research projects. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to say that the order. And then the next topic, which was 28 Cindy Lane. Um, again, this is in the uh, status reports uh, section. We were talking about that DEP had issued an administrative consent order with a penalty and notice of non-compliance to the Aguazara Family Trust. We then edited the following sentence of document had just been received by the office because it wasn't clear who had received the document and had not been reviewed. So that was clarified in that sentence. And this, again, is, uh, I'm addressing the commission. The next sentence, he did advise that this did not invalidate the town's wetlands bylaw. We had just said wetlands bylaw. We wanted to specify that it was this, this town's wetlands bylaw was not being invalidated. And then the next sentence after that, <clears throat> uh, Bazelak will research the status of the superseding order of conditions that, to his knowledge, had not been closed to date. So that was just putting it in future tense that I was directed to track down the status of the previously issued permit for the subdivision. Okay. Do I hear a motion to accept it as rewritten? <clears throat> This is September 9th, 2015. September 8th. Yeah, September I'm 8th. sorry, 8th. Yes, yep. I'm sorry. Eight. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And that brings us to September 29th, 2015. Did everybody have a chance to read and review? Was there anything on that one? Let me just check sure. something. All right, I, you sent me something. Second. No, I don't know, but I got any, did I get something from you? Oh. <laughs> You're going to get it right now oh. <laughs> on the second page. Um, second heading down in regard to the scally item. 
Um, yes. Okay. The last sentence of the return move to issue a complete certificate of compliance and then a number on that says revised. I have no idea why that revised is there. The word revised is there because some of the orders of conditions um, with ongoing conditions. I think this is one where we requested uh, posts with signage where the order may have originally said uh, concrete or granite bounds. It used to be the commission specified right. concrete and granite bounds right. uh, before we broadened the selection to include four by four tree posts. Right. That's just as durable and usually more economical for folks. So that's why the word revised is there. If the word as were inserted in front of it, I wouldn't, can do that. I wouldn't have had a problem. Yeah. It just seemed to be floating by itself. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, I hear a motion to accept that as rewritten. So moved. Second? Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm sorry. Who moved? Howard. Okay. And second? That's Kurt. That's Kurt. That brings us to a review, a request from Jeff Head of Chickadee Hill Farm. Do farm row crops possibly utilize the pond for irrigation on Brad Street Conservation Area? And I believe there is some correspondence when we get to that. I think Mr. Head's also want to tell us something about it too, right? I plan on <laughs> tilling the field over, earth plowing it, tilling it, rototilling it, getting soil, and planning on planting pumpkins and winter squashes in those two fields. Excellent. Which uh, would pretty much not need the pond for irrigation because they're very self-sufficient plants. Right. It's not like corn that needs tons of water. Right. And uh, to my knowledge, you don't use pesticides? We use that? pesticides if needed, right. and I brought the guy that does all my spraying. <laughs> and usually when it comes to um, squashes and pumpkins, the only time you have to spray them with pesticide is when they're little and the cucumber bugs come out. Yep. And I usually backpack spray just the plant. Yep. And then after that, we just have to spray fungicide for later in the season because they'll get wilt and yep. powdery mildew all over them. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Head? So we had received um, comments from Massachusetts Audubon Society. We had um, done outreach with them since they hold the conservation restriction for the property. Um, you want me to read there? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead go okay. Uh, so this is dated May 4th, 2017, uh, addressed to myself since I had outreach to them. Dear Brent, Thank you for notifying us of the request to farm row crops in the fields at Brad Street Farm, most recently by Chickadee Hill Farm. Your CR does allow for the farming of row crops on Brad Street Farm in principle, but other provisions suggest that there should be some limitations. The main sticking points to address with regards to the CR conservation restriction are, number one, the use of the existing pond to irrigate crops, and number two, the use of pesticides. We wanted to send you our interpretation of the CR on both of these points. It would be acceptable to use the pond for irrigation, provided that there is a gauge installed that prevents it from being drawn down too low during a moderate to severe drought. We thought that the town may be able to provide guidance on the exact threshold, but if you are unsure, then we can discuss this further. Next paragraph. The use of pesticides would be acceptable under the CR so long as they are used as a last resort and on a limited basis, such as through IPM, which stands for Integrated Pest Management, as described in the request from Chickadee Hill Farm. These approvals apply only to the Chickadee Hill Farm application. They continue, ultimately, we have concerns about the long-term use of pesticides at the site. Because of the property's proximity to the ocean and salt marsh, it is likely to be affected by sea level rise over the next several decades. 
we ask that the town be mindful that the use of pesticides will eventually need to cease as the o ocean creeps further inland. It is worth noting that this property would be an excellent, excellent candidate for salt marsh migration and the town should consider eventually managing the property to facilitate marsh migration in preparation for the rising sea. If the town is interested, Mass Audubon has a few staff members with a good deal of expertise in this area. Perhaps this may be a good occasion for the town of Raleigh and Mass Audubon to collaborate on this looming issue. <clears throat> Please feel free to contact me if you have questions or if you'd like to discuss this further. Sincerely, Nick Rossi, who is the Conservation Restriction Stewardship Specialist with Massachusetts Audubon Society. So, without getting into the climate change portion of the letter, uh, the takeaway from this is that uh, with some type of monitoring and limits on withdrawal of fresh water from the pond, that would be acceptable. And also the use of pesticides through an integrated pest management program, which is already the proposal from Chickadee Farm, that that would be acceptable and they believe not uh, not a violation of the conservation restriction that's in place. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions with regard to that? And Jeff, you uh, imagine you'd have no problem with... So in other words, I think... We'll I provided Mr. Head, I invited him in earlier today to make sure that he had the yep. various correspondence as well as the other memo which I provided to the commission that I thought we might get into discussing a little bit. Yeah. Um, you'd have no problem with us getting a level for the pond. I wish Sam probably knows more than anybody, but uh, I'd like to know what that pond looked like last August. It was probably only down two or three inches of spring really? fed, yeah. and that, that pond didn't drop much last summer. Really? Wow. I used to jump in as a kid off the diving board after him. Yeah. yeah. They removed Tyson Wood. Yeah, they did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and when I, when I plow the fields up, I'm going to leave the yeah. roads all around and yeah. we'll maintain the grass and everything. We'll make sure it's mowed down. Yep, yeah. good. Uh, yeah, because you I think you actually did have an invasive species problem down there uh, up to a couple of years ago. When it hasn't been hating years, it's, just been, it's been getting brush off down. And yeah. If we flip it over, we can, get, we can get rid of the problem. So the commissioners have a memo that I sent out earlier today. Yep. Has everyone had an opportunity to review that? Yep. Um, the office had done some outreach to the town of Ipswich and also to the town of North Andover uh, because I was familiar that both communities also had conservation land that uh, they allowed to have farming occur on it. Yep. Uh, both communities were um, uh, shared their agreements with us and it, I provided a copy of North Andover's only because North Andover's seemed to use much closer common sense language and not get so much involved into legalese, um, which there's probably nothing wrong with the town of Ipswich's agreement. It may likely say exactly the same thing, it just uses more legal terms right. in regards to uh, phrasing it. Uh, but I did have some suggestions for consideration, for the commission's consideration. Um, and the commission has in the past also discussed uh, moving towards having agreements in place for um, agricultural activities that uh, take place on town conservation land. <clears throat> so what I, what I am recommending that the commission possibly consider is first off adopting an agreement that is structured very similar to how the town of Park Andover has phrased them and without getting into the obvious issues of making sure that it's clear that there isn't any liability to the town, that any activity or use that goes on on the property, if it results in damage to the property, that that needs to be appropriately um, addressed and taken care of, be it restoration or whatever. Uh, so specifically, I had suggested the establishment of the gauge and monitoring of the pond level to establish a minimum depth at which withdrawals would cease. Um, 
So that probably has to be sort of uh, massaged and looked at and not something that we just walk out and make a yeah, one-time judgment. Have, yeah, we'd have to work with it for a year. Yeah, to, so it, to, yeah, to, to, to see what's going on and, and, and see how it, the pond behaves in response to uh, precipitation. Uh, second thing would be to consider a restriction linked to the state drought level status. In other words, if the highest drought level is declared through the state, that that should probably also key in and, and cease withdrawals from the pond. That's more or less just put in there as a stop gap, because usually by the time the state declares a drought, you're usually for sure definitely in a drought. Uh, three, consider the assessment of a minimum fee to cover associated costs for monitoring and possible stewardship activities. Parentheses, I put purchase and install, the gauge, and other markers, etc. Um, both communities seem to recognize and ask for the payment of a minimum fee for the use of their property because they incurred certain costs in order to not only just monitor it, but sometimes just put markers in place so that the, the tilling of the field stayed within tillable areas and didn't go into restricted areas. So there's, there's that consideration which seems a very pragmatic thing. If you're going to have to put things in place because of this usage, it seems like the usage should, uh, should assist with the costs for those things that have to be um, do you have a uh, dollar value on it? Well, right off the bat, since I think we're only talking about um, some type of, well, a, a definitely a stream or river gauge, and then some type of probably metal fence post that that gets mounted to. So I thought $50 would be, because we've already had that property surveyed and marked, so I don't think there's anything further that would really need to be done down there. Uh, next item was consider recognizing the contribution of land management activities that can be applied. Uh, oh, excuse me. Yeah, can be applied to an acreage fee. So North Andover and Ipswich both had a fee. They established a minimum, but they, they had a fee, uh, $25 per acre, that they assessed on the farming activities. But then North Andover provides a provision in there where it recognizes that the person farming the property, if they engage in extra activities, say maintaining the field edge, pruning and keeping a public trail that goes by the tilled acreage, so if they do some extra work, there was a provision in the North Andover Agreement that put a value on that and would credit that towards that assessed fee. That's what Commonwealth and asked us for the uh, yeah. salt mine. Yeah, the, it, it seems like no a, fee, it 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 seems a very yeah. pragmatic approach and you get some stewardship activities um, in the bargain of, in the, in the trade-off of the land being used to harvest a crop, you get some return uh, that goes towards the property. <clears throat> Uh, so then further, yeah, I'll just explain that. Uh, five, require annual proof of liability insurance or other recommended coverage. Uh, six, establish a term of the agreement if it's considered. And, and seven, requiring the reporting of chemical usage uh, as mandated through the IPM program. Uh, that meets mass agricultural standards. Uh, North Andover had a specific provision for an annual report at the end of the year to go to the commission that just identified what had been done, what had been applied, and, and what the quantities were. And, and that seems just a good practical uh, stewardship activity to uh, engage to. So if the town wishes, uh, excuse me, if the commission wishes to enter into an agreement uh, with uh, Mr. Head uh, to farm the property, I would suggest that we request the um, ability to consult with town council and that we draft uh, yep. an and agreement together and sit down. We'll be setting a precedent on this, so yeah. yeah I sit want, down we'll with Mr. Mr. Head and, all, and also communicate with the board. But I think as far as the fee, it should just be the stewardship because that actually 
um, is a is a better deal for us. Is if they take care of and trim back the invasive species and stuff like that, it's better than getting a fifty dollar fee or whatever. Because I do that for a living, I mow stuff back, and it'd be a lot more expensive than right. Yeah. And no, what I'm saying is you charge something, but then you just come back so and you a credit so based well, on them doing that. Right. Yeah. So you don't want to so have, do have a minimum a fee that would pay for putting in the gauge into, into the pond? Um, as far as putting the gauge into the pond, I think Mr. Head could probably do that himself. And then we'll have to, you'll have to go down. Well, you've got, the gauges are a specific. They are. are a specific thing that's an incremented in a weather resistant. I mean, it's probably some kind of. I don't. I don't mind paying for the gauge. Yeah, the gauge. But as far as stewardship, because uh, you're going to trim back and keep everything, the invasive species from going in, which that area actually had a lot of problems with that. Yeah. Well, there's yeah some from Phragmites at the base of that pond that was moving into the field, yeah. and the whole property has got bittersweet and multi. I think I hear what you're saying. Though, if, you, if you assess a fee, and you make the credit the same by doing that extra work, right. it gives some impetus to the person who's going to use the field to do the work. In other words, hey, I'm going to charge you 50, but if you come back and do this other work, I'll take it away. Right. So but, that, uh, but if you don't do it, then you don't, you don't do get it, the, then then you you don't get the credit. $400 then you, to go down. Yeah, well, well, I don't know, yeah. but you're still... I thought yeah. it, it seems to me, rather than go through that complication if you yeah. just make that a condition of the lease. Make you that a condition, that. Well, exactly. That's right. That's, that's yeah. probably yeah. Because we're actually, by doing this, we're setting a precedent for the town of Raleigh when you're going to make sure it's all yeah. done right. And one of the things should be they must maintain the yeah. property right. to our level of acceptance. Right. I agree with you. Let's I think see, that's that, a better way. Well, either way you cut it, though, that involves some town, some town personnel time. <coughs> check on this. Yeah. I think I think the other communities did that so that it was an option, so that it, it provided a pathway and a choice instead of just mandating. Okay, you've got to trim the edges of the field. You got to do this. You got to do that. I think they put that in there just as an option. So, so something happens. His brush hog breaks down right at the time when. We want the field edge managed because we like to have it have that done at certain times of the year. I mean, it, it gives a person an ability to say, "Well, okay, you know, it's going to cost me more in time and effort to go down there and do that. And otherwise, they just want a fifty-dollar fee." We, the acreage is. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned the acreage we are talking about here is not uh, <coughs> not real excessive. Bless you. Um, <coughs> The tillable portions of the field, one is 0.85 acres and the other is 1.5 acres. We're basically talking two acres. So if you charge $25 an acre, you're talking $50 minimum fee that I suggested to begin with. So, you're only talking two acres out of all that property? Yep. Yeah. That's not very much. That includes no. both the no. north field and the south field? Till tillable. It's tillable. Tillable. Yeah. Uh, because you can actually see, which is one of the reasons why I had the photograph up here, this section of the north field gets all the drainage and the sheet flow comes down there, and that's why it, it discernibly looks different, because it's very rough, soggy, or whatever, and it really isn't capable of being uh, tilled. It's not high quality. No, no. Well, it's tillable. And the same thing, well, that, yeah, actually, that's the one that has the most notable, notable section. So when I did the area computations using the aerial photos, I didn't include that. Uh, because I could see right off, I think these were taken uh, back either just after uh, Mr. Colby had tried to do yes. hay, yep. or, or this was 2014, April yep. of 2014. So I can't remember, but I think he may have uh, tried to do um, restore the, the haying capacity of those fields. Mm. But anyway, you can def the aerial photo, you can definitely see where the, where the paths are, where the tractor had gone. So that's why I only used that area to come I'm up with the calculations. If Sam's point, which I, I, I really hear is not a bad idea, is that if you make it a condition of the ongoing contract that they have to do that work, mm -hmm. then you don't have to charge, you don't have to credit. You just say, guess what? 
part of the deal is. I, am, I understand that. I was just telling you that I believe the other communities just put that in there so there was an either or option instead of locking it into one thing. You must do this. That's, I just expressed an opinion yeah. as I, to why the other no, towns I why they did it. Yeah. I think you accomplish the same thing. Right. We, we, mow, we mow Sabatini's yard, um, yeah. the top part that we already plant, so when my guys are there mowing, I just have my commercial mowers go around the fields right, right and around, keep yeah. them, they'll probably be the best they have looked, because yeah. they'll be finished mowers going across the whole outside of the fields. Right. Instead of putting my brush hog on, driving down once a month. Right, and you wouldn't do it for 50 bucks. I wouldn't, because nope. I charge more but than if that. We actually the guys are there mowing, just we actually don't want you doing it once a month. We really only want you doing it in late, late summer, early fall. Well, I didn't know if you wanted the, you know, the grass and everything growing in and people walking out there. A little bit. Well, I mean, we only have one section where it actually goes down to a trail. Okay, because I know there's always been a mowed trail around it. Yeah. So I think we'd, we'd mow the trail. Sabatini kids around on this. <laughs> but in, 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 in the fall, I come in with the brush hog and hit All the right. side of the field out. Does tillable equate to plantable? Yes. So you're only talking, we're only talking about two acres here. Yep. Right. Um, right. You, can get, you, can get high, you can get high production on pumpkins and winter squashes. Yeah. And I small think that's, that's probably the best, uh, the best planting for those fields because it's, yeah. it's not real high quality fields. Yeah. And, and pumpkin, pumpkins, they're, they're hardy. Yeah, they'll be good. Any other questions? I was going to suggest that um, there be a clause in, in the agreement that you will do your best efforts to continue to um, maintain the presence at the Raleigh Farmer's Market. You know, I, I, I see Corey there every, every <laughs> Sunday. Uh, every Sunday I'll be there. Yeah. And I the good thing with these fields is we already plant the top fields. So I'd leave a road in between, but now I can connect the fields. It right. just extends what we already planned. No, it works. It's it's a it's a win-win, I think, for the rally. What's the name of your pesticide expert? I can't. Uh, Jay McDermott, Turning Green. You a Raleigh resident? Uh, actually, I'm an Amesbury resident, but I'm over Jeff so much spraying all of his stuff and taking care of his stuff and buying stuff <laughs> from him that I feel like a Raleigh resident. <laughs> <laughs> I've had dealings with Brent before, so. You know, we're familiar. If you have a, if you have an invasive species uh, problem, we can discuss it. <laughs> in in sensitive areas, we can discuss the cure to that problem. Okay. It sounds like you're a naturalized Raleigh resident. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What do we do at this point? I would recommend that you vote to proceed with putting in place an agreement with Mr. Head, subject to obtaining town council. Seeking any selectmen's guidance on it, and if you're so comfortable structuring towards the North Andover town of North Andover's type of agreement for language, uh, with the provision that stewardship or that type of activity will be a requirement of I, being I, able I to till the fields, and we'll leave off. Yeah, I want the stewardship with just with just the contribution towards the stream gauge. Yeah, and that's for this growing season? Yes. Yeah. Yep. The sooner I get in there, there, the better. The first, the first year of planting won't be as productive as the second year would be, just because we're flipping a field over and the soil's going to still be tight. Yeah. I just, do I hear such a motion? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I have a okay. question. Go ahead. Um, don't we have to have some sort of an expert install a water gauge? I mean, how do you... No, we're going to have to, that, and no, gonna have to uh, play it by ear ourselves uh, the first year. To, um, Who's going to do that? Well, we can rely on Mr. Head and I can, Brent. I can look up whatever the correct protocol is for monitoring water levels. But the first year is going to be kind of a uh, feeling as you're going because right. we don't know. Um, yeah, we don't know how that water body behaves. Exactly. Uh, we also don't know what the precipitation levels are, are going to be. And, right. and really, it's just a judgment call to figure out how much is groundwater fed and how much is runoff coming down from the field. I think it's a combination of both. Have, I'm, I'm sure there is actually from having gone yeah. to that site. I know where the runoff comes down from the <clears> field. If this weather keeps up, we won't need the water now. No. Yeah. <laughs> Last year you were correct. Last year was rough. Story, yeah. <laughs>
Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think the, you know, play by ear. So that's approved then? Yes. yes. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Good growing. Yeah. Have a good night. Like it. Yeah. Because you're through work early. What's that? You're through work early today. I still got sawdust on my legs. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is a legal notice for the Raleigh Conservation Commission in accordance with the Wetland Protection Act, Mass General Law 131, Section 40, as amended in the Town of Raleigh Wetlands Protection Bylaw. Public meeting will be held on Wednesday, May 10th, 2017, 7.5, Room 5, Town Hall, Annex, 39 Central Street, to consider the request and determine the determination of applicability for the application filed by Anthony Gavisi for the proposed clearing and grading of 1,600 square foot wooded area to convert to lawn possibly within 100 feet of a buffer zone bordering vegetated wetlands at 320 Weathersfield Street, map 18, parcel 5, lot 22-3 in Raleigh. You have the <laughs> So basically, I uh, just want to extend the backyard of 40 by 40, as uh, you just read. Um, right now, the way it is, is the backyard is pretty, pretty close to off the house, and I'm trying to sell the house, and um, everyone's biggest problem with the house is the backyard's not big enough. So the way the land slopes, the square base square I'd be extending makes it the easiest place and, you know, the, the best place to extend it. And um, that's pretty much it. It's pretty basic. Uh, where's your septic? My septic's in the front. In the front, okay. So, yeah, just as a, a brief explanation, um, when the three lots were developed, this is the last of, of three lots. This is the westernmost parcel, and there's forested wetlands down here. Woods extends all the way up, and so as not to get into further permitting, the clearing and the erosion control for the development of this property was set uh, so that it kind of ran right along the 100 foot buffer zone line of the forested uh, wetlands and didn't intrude in that at all so consequently yeah there's a large landscaped lawn area in the front of the house and in the rear of the house this is on an approximate anywhere from 18 to 20 feet in width. That just happened to be the way it worked out because they didn't want to go through any further permitting right. and the erosion control. Of Is it uh, old growth? Work. Well, I'm going to show you. Mm. Um, the short answer is no, uh, but it is a forest. So, maple. So, we got a mixture of pine with oak. And let's see if I can get this thing to. Say so it's probably 90% pine, would you say, Brett? Yeah. Yeah, there's that's probably one of the biggest trees you see right there too. Yeah, okay. they're and they're kind of scattered, spaced anywhere from twenty to thirty. So that still leaves you sixty feet from the wetlands. Correct. Yeah. This is probably the best descriptive picture here, just showing the fact that there's a slope, mm -hmm. and it's the water. way. Well, because. We're just seeking permitting, and, and Mr. Gravelisi is actually hoping that he doesn't have to implement this. It's really speculation that it would be an exact square. It could be that the person who, if they do wish to expand the backyard, they may wish to do it more linear. They may, um, I'm going to go back to the plan. Well, do you Insta oh, instead do you of going to 40 foot depth, they may wish to just go 20 feet and extend down to here and just kind of even it out. So, so we're, he's sort of showing you yep. the, the maximum, I hate, I hate to use the word worst case, but he's showing you just a, a typical square for the 1,600 square feet of lawn. 
that 1,600 square feet, though, because of the slope, we think the cut and fill would balance it, but in order to have a stable slope, you'd have to have to taper it. You'd have to have a three to one slope on your western edge, and your eastern edge would also then have to have a three to one slope going down to it, unless they utilize some type of modular landscape wall or boulders or something. There are a number of ways to implement this that the commission doesn't need to have to necessarily design it that way. Um, so, so I've proposed... Can I interrupt just a second? Sure. Oh, absolutely. Um, I guess I have a concern with regard to what you're saying. Um, are you planning on doing this before it's bought, or are you going to negotiate this with a buyer? Um, once just you... Basically, just to make the better sell, just to say, hey, listen, if you want the, you know, if the backyard's the real killer on the deal, mm -hmm. you know, the, all the legwork's been done and the permit's been pulled, and, you know, you can, you know, here's, you know, basically here's what I, you know, drew up, and if you want to go with something like this, you know, you, you could. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? So it's not going to be done before... So in other words, you're not, it could you're not, not be done at all. You know, you yeah. know, you know, anybody could buy the house and decide, hey, I don't want to even do the backyard. But you know, if they did, then you know, they have the option basically. Just make it a little easier, so that way they don't have to, you know, when people hear permits and you know, conservation, they get all nervous. So he's proving by yeah. obtaining a permit, he's proving that it could be could implemented, be but yeah. not necessarily yeah. doing the implementing himself. Correct. Well, if a buyer didn't want to do it. I guess I'd have a little bit of a problem off the top of my head with regard to having that open-ended forever and ever. It isn't. The permit only lasts for three years. That's it. I have no problem with that. I have, and uh, <clears throat> I think that, you know, yeah, that would make a lot of difference to somebody that, I don't know, a bunch of kids or whatever. Exactly. Um, you do have to understand, un unlike street frontage properties, this property is set way back in yeah. Weathersfield Street. I, I can see. Well, I'm just, I'm house. just, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> saying. So this it. really, in one sense, this is kind of speculative that someone is because there's technically this absolutely lovely front yard yep. that's nice and level that you could have at least two badminton or volleyball courts yeah. set up on. Um, so again, this is. This is more or less a suggestion from his realtor who thought that some folks expressed the fact that the rear backyard was quote unquote skinny. And so, you know, right. Well, that makes sense to me, and I'm not opposed to the idea in general. I just don't like the amorphousness of it all. But as long as it's conditioned in such a way that, that we have a chance to lay out whatever is finally agreed upon with regard to the square, yes, which square would, footage. Well, and that's, and that's why you see a little different variety of conditions being suggested for this particular application. Uh, the first thing that's a little, uh, little different is that the lim number three, the limits, limits of clearing to be clearly marked and verified by a Rally Conservation Commission commissioner or staff person prior to tree cutting. Uh, temporary erosion control, silt fence combined with compost or bark mulch sock. That's because of the possibility of having, bal having to balance the cut and fill. <coughs> compost bark mulch sock only nine inches in diameter is not going to do it on a three foot tapered slope of fill on one side. And that's why the silt fence is recommended uh, to be used in combination here. <coughs> Uh, I also then say number five, verification of location and correct installation of the erosion control barriers prior to the earth disturbing activity. So, so there's a little bit more of a review and verification going on here just because of this kind of amorphous nature. And also that forested slope continues down right to where the bordering vegetated wetlands is located. And that's actually the area that starts an intermittent stream that actually goes down to our newest gift of land um, right. yeah. on the eastern I side of Batchelder Brook. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, it works its way down to one of those culverts that uh, Sandy Patrickin took out for us right. in, the, in yep. decommissioning that common driveway. Um, so 
So what would we just have a motion to? This is like any other request for determination. So if if you if the commission is comfortable with the way I've proposed uh, the conditioning on this, uh, you can uh, consider issuing a negative determination with option number three, incorporating the special conditions above. Uh, a couple of other questions. Go ahead. Uh, is the determination of ability typically recorded? No, it is not. There's no reason why it should, couldn't be, though, right? Town Council has told us in the past that you can record anything. <laughs> what, what <troubles laughs> with the proper notations on it. What troubles yeah. me about these tree cutting situations, and we've had numerous instances over the years where the contractor comes in and just does whatever they want to and and afterwards the homeowner or the <coughs> applicant says, well, I didn't know we were going to do it and I showed up and it was all done. Um, I think if we can record this and make it part of the record prior to the sale of the property that that, um, that puts everybody on notice with regard to that. Okay. Um, so I would like to see that done, number one. And number two, I guess deals with the, another question I had, and that is uh, whether there sh should be a no cut, no disturb um, area mark with regard to the remaining forested land outside of this area. Well, he's over 100 he's feet from it, so I mean, it's away. still, yeah. It, it, you would have to be, you'd have to go past where he's going to cut to put those signs up, so it's kind of, yeah. yeah. I don't have a problem with that. Well, I mean, it's so it's mature woods, and the bylaw does give the commission the ability to establish a, I believe, a maximum 50 foot no cut, no disturbance area. If you wanted to condition uh, the positioning of, I guess I'd have to say, the way the wetlands is. If we're going to make him put up a 50 foot no cut, no disturb, then he should be able to clear everything right down to the well, the whoever the future property owner is, as well as the current property owner, yes, could come back with a different request to determine applicability and could propose more clearing. Yes, you, you do not shut off the ability of a property owner to apply for, for a, anything in the future, even even going into what had previously been been called a no cut, no disturb. You can always apply. Um, and, and find out what the answer will be. Um, so that would not that would not cut off that ability. I think Commissioner Turner is just concerned because uh, the woods are kind of open there. Um, I think Commissioner Turner is just saying, well, the best way to let a property owner know there's a restricted area is to have a couple posts with signs um, put out there. There's nothing that mandates that they have to be on the edge of the lawn. That's just where we typically do put them. Uh, but in my other life in the city of Haverhill, we have had instances where we do put markers further back into the woods just to let the property or property owner know that if they do contemplate going back further, enlarging uh, their open space, that they are running into a restricted area so they can adjust their plans accordingly. Yes. I just wanted to throw that out to see how the rest of the commission felt about it. <clears throat> Yeah, necessarily um, feel all that strongly, but um, the more buffer you have, I mean, you've got all that Bay State glass property backed up on the back side of that property, and and yeah, the more woods they take out, the enormous amount of noise coming out of there. But that's not, you know, a lot of it's yeah. leased out by Bay State glass, and there's no guarantee that that noise level won't increase. And the more buffer you have with regard to tree uh, keeping the noise level down, it's the better. Well, I have no problem with it, uh, um, and going on record, which would probably help this gentleman uh, with the value of his property. Um, do I hear a motion to? Well, give a let's just let's just yeah. clarify that. Well, do any of the other commissioners uh, wish to support uh, Commissioner Turner's desire for, say, two no cut, no disturbance posts to be installed within the woods at the 50-foot distance from? The bordering vegetated wetlands, just as kind of a, a warning width? type thing. What what's the width of the lot? I don't know. I don't have that information. So what are those signs that you're on me right now? I mean, it's it's. I mean, it's got a view. It's probably 200 feet wide at least. So it's 100 feet apart. So it's 
So on that diagram, where would those signs go approximately? I mean, did you have that diagram? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll go back to that sketch. Yeah, where you had your... So approximately, where would those signs be put? It'd be left so... So... It'd be what, down here somewhere? Mm -hmm. They would be... Around in here? Right about there. Yeah. If it's... Because this... this well, yeah, so this is 100 feet. You can't really see the, uh, yeah, yeah. the wetlands delineation was very thin, but right where that arrow ends is the point of it. So that's, this to there is 100 feet. Halfway back is somewhere right around there, because that's 40 feet. So, so this is probably the 50 foot right around in that area somewhere. Well, it's a couple hundred feet wide. Well, it's 100 feet wide. I, I'm actually not sure how much further into that wetlands before you actually run into the Ipswich Bay glass property. Because I believe that's the same wetland system that's at the base where they put their new stormwater basin in. I think it's not a bad idea, actually. Well, I think the markers are a good idea. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, that way somebody just can't go crazy out there. At least there's some... Well, they'll, they'll provide locations. some type of visual warning yeah, exactly. to the property owner that, oh, this is an area that... It's got some kind of restriction. I should go find out about Especially it. Especially if you're a future owner, you you know they they're going to see in their contract they have the right to do some clearing. Yeah. You buy it, but then you it'd be nice to know that when you walk out there, you know that hey, you're not going any. You got right. something that's very clearly stating you're not going any farther than that. Right. So you've got that's something on the idea. ground, and that combined mm -hmm. with recording is going to put whoever purchases the property on on notice. On notice, that, you don't go any farther. Not a bad idea. What does a post cost? Not an awful lot. Not a lot Two eight foot four by fours, and we provide the aluminum discs. So. Just don't make me put them up around my property. <laughs> <laughs> There's no grandma, no grandfather clause in You mean we didn't put some up? We did that. No. <laughs> This property is mostly all au natural anyway. <laughs> I think Brett was going to die. We had tractors out of marsh cutting the hay. That was your first meeting with salt hay, wasn't it? Possibly, but I knew I knew salt hay was yes. harvested. No, it wasn't. It wasn't a, in a pit yeah. Yeah. Here's a Highlander. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know what main, a, cord, a main, I know, he's a main guy. He's I know what a corduroy road is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that would have made it. Um, okay, so do we need a motion? So yes, uh, motion, and what are you going to have on it? With two posts and two recording posts. of the determination. Does that sound okay with you? Sounds good. Okay. Negative option. Do I have such a motion? Right here. Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good. Thank you. Good Thank luck. you. Good luck. Okay, this is a legal notice, Raleigh Conservation Commission. In accordance with the Wetlands Protection Act, Mass General Law 131, Section 40, as amended by the Town of Raleigh Wetlands Protection Bylaw, a public meeting will be held on Wednesday, May 10th at 8 o'clock, room 5 Town Hall Annex at 39 Central Street, to consider a request for determination of applicability for the application filed by Sharif Abuzara of Spring R Realty Trust for the proposed grading and soil stockpile management activities possibly within 100 foot of the buffer zone or bordering vegetative wetlands in the DEP approved groundwater protection area zone 2 at 982 and 992 and lot 1 Havel Street map 4 parcel 
20, Lot 2, Apostles 19, and 19-1 in Rowley. You have the floor. <coughs> What we are doing at present is really grading this area. We have here a very high uh, hill. Thank you. We have here a very high hill. And uh, in fact, I think it was a volcanic uh, uh, ledge area. We blasted this one and we are grading it. And we have piled uh, ledge and uh, some of the soil here, we have one here, we have one here, one here, and we have here. Now this line here uh, it takes care of uh, ABZ storage, and that is all. Okay. And, uh, the 100 uh, line buffer zone is here. Okay, so you're right at the edge of it. Yeah. One? You have that. That line you just said, that's the 100 foot? This is a 100 foot buffer zone. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Now, I've prepared uh, a memo, which I believe uh, yes. the commissioner should have. So, the one little jurisdictional thing that is currently missing from the sketch plan <coughs> that I have requested be added is there is an isolated vegetated area right in here. Um, which some of the clearing and grading, so that, that casts its own 100 foot buffer zone that actually more than likely encompasses all of those uh, piles. <clears throat> and the clearing uh, got up to uh, 16 to 18 feet uh, to where that is. So I'm going to switch now to pictures of the site. Uh, and this just got two pictures here. Let's see what's going on. Those are the two that you handed. Yeah. yeah. So, so actually, yeah. So, this picture shows that they um, this started off with the issuance of a notice of violation, and right. uh, uh, Mr. Abuzawra came in. The commission discussed, and it, both under the stormwater and the wetlands bylaw and wetlands protection act. So. The Commission decided that the best way to approach this was to do a request to determine applicability and issue a permit that called for proper maintenance of erosion control, etc. Construction site crushed stone entrance exit pad uh, to uh, cure the tracking of vehicles that were leaving his site with blasted ledge, etc. So this area here, uh, site visit that Saeed and I had on uh, the 4th, I believe it was. We went out and measured from the flagging that's back in here and this falls right at 16 to 18 feet. So the Commission normally wants to see 25 feet of undisturbed area. So, so my suggestion was that the erosion control be anchored in place because it had not been staked in place. And in fact in some cases it just went up over this downed tree so it wasn't doing much. So it needed to be correctly installed. And then I suggested that uh, we put in the memo and on site that that orange safety fencing uh, be actually staked at the 25 foot mark and that he see the area behind there. Just to, uh, give to it get a, it to regrass in, to establish. Because you see, in, in the other picture, you can see there's a lot of field grass um, out in that area. You can, see here that there's a lot of areas that are just grass right, right. underneath some of the saplings that have been moving back into uh, that site. Yeah. Uh, so the idea, um, the idea again is just to achieve proper erosion control, stabilization leading to a vegetated cover, show where that 25 foot no cut, no disturb would have been if it, we'd been right. contacted ahead of time and have the sketch plan show that isolated vegetated uh, wetland area. Okay. Crushed stone entrance exit pad has already been put in, yep. uh, so that's done. And I had the suggested conditions here included our usual, because this is a zone two, that there be a spill containment here on site. 
um, and then talked about, again, what I just went over about establishing, uh, getting the erosion control properly installed, put in place, doing some of the reseeding of that area, get the orange fencing up, <clears throat> and basically let it, let it grow it and let the rain water it, and, and that's all. Any questions? Did you get a copy of that? Huh? Did you get my copy of the memo via email? What did you send it? Today? No, not yet. Okay. Hold on. So I had a little scare on this this afternoon when I started looking at the details because it turned out that the firm that had put the application package together for uh, Mr. Abuzar had not checked off that they sent a copy to the DEP regional office, which is a requirement right. before the commission can hold a meeting and open this up to discussion, there needs to be notification. Now it turned out that Hayes had actually done it. Yes. When I was, so, so Mr. Abu Zara had his contact, um, Elizabeth Wallace, at Hayes, send me the proof of mailing and the green card, and it turned out they'd mailed it back on April 24th. They just didn't let us know, didn't give us the copy, which is part of the normal application package. So for a brief minute there, I was afraid so we weren't going to have everything. this meeting tonight. Yeah. What's the revised sketch plan? Well, what, what, what do you currently the sketch plan is missing the that isolated foot. vegetated. There's an isolated vegetated wetland area between Mr. Carpeno's property at 970 and his drive, which you do not see on here, mm -hmm. and Sharif Abu Zara's yeah, yeah. property over there. Right. Half of it's on Sharif. It's, it's very narrow. It's three or four feet wide, I and maybe we 20 to 25 feet so, long. Yeah. Um, it's so just need to update this. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, it's a, it's a sketch plan. We're not asking that no. this plan be stamped, and the commission is not confirming the delineation there. But we do know it's there. It was flagged when Dunn Landscaping just built their building. Right. The, plas the plastic flags, you can still see them very clearly sitting there in, in the woods. Okay. All right. Do I hear a motion to accept it, it with the revised sketch? Go ahead. Could I speak anything? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I am not comfortable to speak about isolated wetland here. Let me say what is going on. This area here, the elevation is 110 feet, 90 feet, and here the elevation is 76 feet. I show it on the plan here. The elevation here is 72 feet, 73 feet. So water ha that has the natural flow of going from here to here. Now, we have here a driveway. Yep. And in the, in the last let me say 15 years what is happening is there was no isolated wetland whatsoever here now what happened in the last three four years when the land here changed ownership they have this driveway here which was raised and widened in order to accommodate heavy machinery going to this area i don't want to raise and a big issue about this. Well, something like this happened with me in Rowdy about 20 years ago when I built the development meeting house village, St. Delane and Wilkes Road. When I had Wilkes Road coming from Harrison Circle to St. Delane, uh, <coughs> there was wetland on one side of the road and a little of it 
uh, there was very uh, water was coming to this. The Conservation Commission of the town of Rowley said, let us solve it simply. Put a couple of pipes going from this side to that side so the water keeps going into its natural flow. Uh, what I suggest here, if you will, ladies and gentlemen, it is in your hands to request or ask the owner of the land who widened this driveway and raised it to put a couple of pipes from here going into its natural flow to this one. And then we'll have no problem. Thank you. Because originally our land didn't have any, you know, any wetland. Yeah. And I'll, I'll show you here. This is, yeah, this is, uh, no, it's yeah, that is it. Here is a busy story. And this is in 1999. <coughs> this is the high plateau here, mm -hmm. 110 feet. This is 90 feet. And the water was going this way. This is here. He was referring to this point. The elevation is 76 feet. And I have this one here from the elevation on this one here, the wetland here, is 72 feet, 73 feet. So the water natural was going from here all the way to this wetland here which was there for, from time immemorial. Now when this was raised or widened, of course it imprisoned some, some water here. And uh, the easiest way is really to have a couple of pipes going from here under the raised high, uh, driveway into its natural flow. Well, that would be draining well, excuse me, with all due respect, the Commission has no authority on Mr. Capeno's property and has no ability to mandate that he take any type of actions in regard to this issue. Uh, the Commission has, in its public record, it has plans that were submitted, that were reviewed by both an engineer and a wetlands consultant, and then were reviewed by the Commission's wetlands consultant. Uh, that clearly delineate an isolated vegetated wetland. In my 12, in my 13 years now of working for the town of Raleigh, in 2016, this was the first time the commission received an application that scrutinized, scrutinized that portion of 970 and 968 Haverhill Street. So, in all honesty, I can't, I cannot say, as Mr. Abuzar has definitively stated that that isolated vegetated wetlands, exactly how long it's been there, or what its provenance is, what either caused it, what initiated it, what happened to it. And that's, again, immaterial to the Commission's deliberations tonight. It's what it is now, right. The Commission issued notices of violation clearly for work that had no permit, that disturbed earth, that created unstable stockpiles of soil that had no erosion control barriers around them, which was contrary to both the Wetlands Protection Act for activities within the buffer zone, and also contrary to our stormwater and erosion control bylaw. The proposal before you tonight, which was the recommendation for by this commission to the property owner to come into compliance, was to get a permit which would properly protect and establish erosion control and limits of work around the jurisdictional wetland resource areas that are on 982, 992, and Lot 1, which does not have any street address, which is where this activity has been taking place. There isn't any proposal for construction. There's no proposal for putting in drainage. And there's also no regulatory authority to go over onto an abutting piece of property. Um, so 
And again, this is not a professionally stamped plan. The commission is only looking for a sketch plan, and they are not confirming the delineation of any of these resource areas. They're just kind of pointing them out so we know where the erosion control and where the limit of work can go. Otherwise, the applicant and the property owners are not going to be in compliance. Great. Whose roadway is that? On whose land? Mr. Carpenter. Yeah. For 970 Abel Street. I think you should have raised your objection when he put the roadway in. I'm sorry? I think you should have raised your objection with Mr. Carpeno when, when the roadway was put in. It's well, we did raise it. I, I think we did raise it. And, uh, I'm you, not sure you were even here in Raleigh because it was a John DeCoolis plan from 1983 that had that driveway going back when Mr. Harrison developed the property. Well, uh, let me say this. There were only small cars going there, and the driveway was very low and very narrow. And uh, let, let me say even here, you know where it is supposed to be, somewhere here. This part here, this is an easement to the forest department where they will be driving all the way and putting their cars here. And uh, if you see the plan here, if you see the plan here, I hope I'm right. This is the easement. And the forest department is supposed to put the three, five cars here. And the, when we did, the, when we gave, the, when I gave this, or my son gave this easement to the forest department, they came and checked it, and uh, we did not find any uh, of the wetland here. And if you see this, here it is. And it was done in 2007. And that easement here, the five cars will be here. How they came, watched it, and so on. I don't want to raise a big problem about it, you know, at present. We, where did it come, I don't know. It was low, and this one here, I heard about it only three, four years ago when I came this. I read the issue at that time, and you remember that? Yeah, we came here and we told them about it. Uh, we didn't have this. And even if you look at this one here, which came 2017, and th this is the wetland here, Please. which is this wetland. What? Again, with all <laughs> due respect, those, those, those are not, much, those are not, those are not official. orders of resource area delineation yeah. issued by this commission. So those are not legally valid delineations of wetland resource areas. Those are just from the yeah. state overlay. Well, we uh, can solve it simply by having a couple of pipes there and... Uh, it's not your property. Well, it's not your property and this commission has no authority but, uh, to tell a private property owner yeah, what but, to do on their property. Yeah, they told me to put those two pipes to, uh, 15, 20 years ago on Wilkes Road. You can go and you see them there. But excuse me, isn't the town responsibility to see how it will affect the neighbors when someone does something? I mean, isn't it the responsibility of someone else to see how it will affect the neighbors? When was that road put in? I don't know what they That's, what, that's what exactly time. why they're here before the commission tonight, because they have unstabilized huge stockpiles of soil that are capable of eroding onto a budding property, and it just so happens there's an isolated vegetated wetland area there which this commission, through its bylaw, right. is sworn to protect as a protectable wetland plant community. So are they willing to comply with this? I, I, I think if you just vote and tell them to, then it's up to them as to whether yeah. they comply or not. I mean, if they don't comply, just comply. we'll be back. Mm. <clears throat> you don't have to worry about the pipes, just do this. You see, but if we put the wetland here, that means we are acknowledging there is a wetland in our land, and that well, will be Well, there's either wetland or there isn't. You can't change it. Or yeah, drain. we've been told. But it wasn't lot. before. I mean, for so many years, we never had a wetland. I mean, suddenly it is appearing. How come can it appear? I mean, well, that, it's that's a that's an entirely different subject than what we have going.
You see, we are abiding with everything, but we don't want to acknowledge the... Uh, the then and again, a sketch plan, a sketch plan that is not professionally stamped does yeah. not provide any legal certainty that that has been a delineated and confirmed wetland resource area. So again, I'm sorry, Mr. Abuzar and Jahid Abuzar's argument is totally superfluous. Right. That is not what the Commission is deciding on tonight. The Commission already has plans in the public record for Mr. Dunn's project, which includes the easement on Mr. Carpeno's property for 968 and 970 Haverhill Street that shows that isolated vegetated wetland there as a officially delineated resource area. But that's on Mr. Carpeno's and Mr. Dunn's property, 968 and 970. That is not on 982. Uh, could I say one word? Go ahead. The amount of the wetland he is speaking about here, half of it is on the neighbor's land, the other half is here. And the only, uh, it is only 430 feet, 30 square feet uh, uh, on this property. And that where the easement of the forest department is, only 400, 430 feet. This is not a big thing to speak about and waste your time about it. And, and, right. yet, and yet you're keeping the commission tied up here. And yeah, I was to go past I get really grouchy when I get back and stay late. You may want to try to negotiate with Mr. Carpeno about coming to some sort of agreement, in which case you'd probably both have to file a notice of intent before us to put those pipes in. would be my guess. Exactly. Good point. So all we can do tonight is we can. Got, I've got the recommendation. So I. Do I hear such a motion? Do you want? Um, so within 14 days, get a revised sketch plan with a negative, and then we can issue a negative determination. Option number three, incorporating the special conditions above. All eight. Do I hear such a motion? Do you want to vote on it or re uh, we uh, postpone till next time and this week? Would you like to vote for it? I would like to continue the, so the that facts we... facts are not going to change. They are in evidence before the commission. Can we check with our engineer and attorney? Could we? And postpone it for well, next meeting? It's not going to change what we're going to do, right? No. no. Right. So we might as well vote on it. Yeah. I mean... Do we accept the motion? Yes. I'm, so Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 14 days. 14 days. Okay. Thank you. Cindy Lane. 14 Cindy Lane, this commission may remember, they had done some soil testing and they had left the soil evaluation pits as depressions and they chose not to develop the lot for a decade. When we came back to actually permit putting the house on the lot, those pits left for the soil evaluations had turned into isolated vegetated wetlands. Oh, yeah. And actually through through the permitting process, they were allowed to basically fill those areas, but then compensate. Well, actually, what we did was we went back to a much bigger isolated vegetated wetland area and just kind of fixed the, fixed the perimeter of that to accomplish, to incorporate those few square footages of those disconnected soil evaluation pits. They had, they had actual sedges growing out of them, if I remember correctly. I remember seeing the pictures, though, that was, that was during my time. All right, this brings us to our 8.15. Um, yes, now, do not... I don't know if I'm Mr. Chairman. 
Do not open this. Uh, let me just check the agenda again. Uh, yes, we need to have a discussion first about the request for waiver of the bylaw fee before this hearing can be opened. All right, so there's nothing to read. I'll just read from this. Right. When when we get the decision on the bylaw fee, then we'll read the legal ad and, and proceed. All right. Let me just get things cleared off. I think I provided all the commissioners with uh, the uh, Warren Cameron's uh, letter of waiver request. If you don't, please let me know. Try to find it. There you go. That's this one. Okay. Yes. All right. Do you want me to read this, or why don't I read it? Why don't I read it into the record? Go ahead. Uh, so this is dated May fifth, twenty seventeen. Uh, to the Conservation Commission regarding fee waiver request for 101 Main Street, owner, Firehouse Inn, LLC, applicant, Gerard uh, Fendetti, is that how it's pronounced? Yeah. Gerald. Gerald. And the more Carol, the more Cameron Group, dear commission members, we have submitted a notice of intent application for the above property. As part of the application, we requested a waiver from your local bylaw fee. It has come to our attention that the original application did not specify what the correct bylaw fee would have been. Also, the Conservation Office has requested additional justification for the waiver request. We are preparing this letter to show what the original bylaw fee would be and to provide the reasoning behind our waiver request. In accordance with the Town of Raleigh's Wetlands Protection Bylaw Fee Worksheet, the proposed project would fall under Project Category F, Commercial and Industrial Projects. The associated fee for this category is $500 for each building plus 0 0.50 or 50 cents per square foot of disturbance in a resource area as described in the Town of Raleigh's Wetlands Protection Bylaw. Work proposed within the buffer zone to the wetlands and potential vernal pool is the construction of a portion of one building and disturbance of approximately 18,900 square feet. The fee associated with this activity would be $9,950. Approximately 15,830 square feet of the area proposed to be disturbed within the buffer zones is currently developed or maintained. Therefore, only 3,070 square feet of undisturbed buffer zone is proposed to be altered. It is our request that the alter, alteration fee of 50 cents per square foot be applied to the alteration of undisturbed buffer zone only. Based on this, the fee would be calculated using one building and a disturbance area of 3,070 square feet, which results in a total fee of $2,035. As part of the project, we are proposing invasive species management and mitigation enhancement of the buffer zone and wetlands. This work will have a positive impact to the resource area. We are proposing wetland and buffer zone mitigation slash enhancement as mitigation for work within the vernal pool buffer zone. The removal of invasive species is being done to increase the value and function of the wetlands and vernal pool. To assist in offsetting the costs of the invasive species management, we are requesting that the Commission reduce the bylaw fee for this project to be assessed at the same fee for the same activity under the Wetlands Protection Act, which is $1,050. Please find attached a copy of your bylaw fee worksheet showing the required fee and the, requested and, and the fee requested. We look forward to meeting with the Commission on Wednesday, May 10th, to discuss the request. If you have any questions prior to the meeting, please do not hesitate to contact me. Sincerely, Warren Cameron Group, John Warren, uh, Principal Engineer and Principal.
Sam. Hmm? Comments? Not at this point. So let, so let me just say um, that the seems we keep talking about Harold Street tonight. Uh, the Moore and Cameron Group also represented uh, Dunn uh, Landscaping at 968 right. Haverhill Street. And we had a similar, um, similar situation with that property where um, you could examine the aerial pictometry that was available uh, showing that and the property had two, two wooden frame structures on it that needed to be demolished. Uh, definitely indicating that the property had in the past uh, been developed. And you could also see from the uh, vegetative plant community and the predominance of invasive species in the areas that had been previously apparently cleared. And so uh, the Moore and Cameron Group made the same request for consideration of fee adjustment uh, for that project, which the commission was amenable to. Uh, although there's nothing that specifies uh, one way or the other in the bylaw fee. It, um, the commission has taken the uh, interpretation that it seems clear that the assessment of the bylaw fee is meant to be applied to undis previously undisturbed properties and not necessarily to be applied to areas that have been maintained as lawn or maintained as um, a paddock or a livestock uh, paddock, which we think uh, happened on 968 Haverhill Street. So that is one of the uh, uh, support pillars of support uh, for the argument that's being uh, made to the commission tonight. Uh, the other argument of support, uh, while it has some applicability to 968 uh, Haverhill Street, uh, also the commission. Uh, was amenable to the development that recently occurred of 414 Haverhill Street of taking into account that a uh, wetlands uh, mitigation and in invasive species enhancement program was being applied uh, to undisturbed areas of the, of the property in order to control a, a, a definite uh, predominance of invasive species over the native plant community on those parcels. So. Again, that does kind of support that the commission has been amenable and has uh, reacted positively uh, to requests for adjustment of the fee uh, when given uh, the opportunity to have environmental enhancement projects take place on the property. So, so I understand the reduction in the first step. I don't understand the amount of the reduction in the second step. What is that based on? Let me help you all. Give me just one second to access, uh, hopefully, both the plan uh, as well as So current site conditions from a recent visit. <coughs> this is the potential pool in the background. At the edge of lawn, this is what you first encounter for a plant community. This is dominated by Japanese knotweed, multiflora rose, with its lovely thorns, <clears throat> and then topped with a nice curling canopy of oriental bittersweet with almost no native woody stem plant species surviving on this particular interface, uh, which is part of it is uh, bordering vegetated wetlands that fringes the pond. And then that is the, this, you're looking at the area that we normally look to 
be a 25 foot no cut, no disturbance area. And this is just one picture. Do I have some other ones here? Yes, I do. Uh, this really gives you a sense of how bad the Oriental Bittersweet is. It's totally smothering uh, those, those trees in the area. And this is the very edge. This is the erosion control. Previously, the commission uh, received a permit request for uh, the um, digging of some soil evaluation pits for purposes of stormwater uh, drainage design considerations. So this is the edge of the previously altered area that is within the buffer zones. It's been maintained as long. There are some mature um, oaks and hickories, I think. Uh, that are there, but mostly it's been uh, treated as, as a lawn. Uh, so what they're saying is they'll remove that, and for that removal, they're saying that's worth a thousand dollars. Well, all right. So let me let me show you some of the details. So yes, they've proposed a planting and mitigation plan that would return woody stemmed native vegetation to those areas and would remove the invasive species component. And they're proposing uh, two years. Uh, I'm not going to go any further. Hopefully that's enough, because I think when we actually open the project hearing or whatever, but this gives you the basis uh, for their, their request for a reduction. They are talking about a very substantial um, planting and invasive species suppression program uh, that probably exceeds the uh, probably exceeds the 3,000 square feet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It so exceeds but I am understanding that so. the final fee that they are want to spend is 1,050. Am I reading that right? Yeah. Yeah. So for, because you have the reduction, the first reduction is due to the previously disturbed area, then the second one is right. for this, this value, they're putting a value of $1,000 on that. Good evening. For the record, John Morin from the Morin Cameron Group. Um, with regards to your question about reducing an extra thousand for the mitigation, I mean, that mitigation works a lot more I'm sure it is. than that. What we did Probably is just we, a planting stock. Is yeah, yeah. <laughs> what we did is we looked at, like we did with the other project, what was the filing fee under the Wildlife Protection Act? And we said, well, at a minimum, we got to at least propose to the commission that we'll pay the fee that's required under the Wetlands Protection Act. So that's how we got down from the 2000 down to the 1050. Is that the total of the state fee or is that? Yeah, the total of the state fee is yeah. 1050. This project is, is technically mostly just buffers on. So that's, the, and that is the, that's the level or the category for a commercial. Correct. Commercial site development. So there's no no wetlands filling proposed on this. Anybody else? Kurt, you must have something. I guess I had a question about you're talking about some sort of overlook of the uh, Brimble Pool, the potential Brimble Pool area. What? What are you contemplating there? It's well, actually just a crushed stone. It's a crushed stone walkway that was going to come down here and broaden out into this area right here and possibly have a couple benches installed. And yeah, they, did you want to get into that when we open the public hearing? Yeah, I mean, but, well, but I mean, it, but yeah, well, I, just, I didn't know whether you were constructing a walkway, it's an elevated thing or not. And then, no, it's all, there's no grade changes, very minimal grade changes. You can actually see on the plan, just to get the walkway down through here, we've got some minor grade changes, but no tree removal. There'll be no um, elevations. We're actually, and I'll talk about it in the presentation, I talked to Brent briefly about we're going to pull that overlook area outside that 25 foot no disturb. Uh, originally we proposed to maintain the existing limit of work that was out there. Um, after meeting with Brent, we're actually going to pull that back and we'll restore that 25 foot no disturb. But I'll get into that in more detail uh, during the presentation. Okay, I just, it, you know, I find it 
intellectually interesting that if, in fact, that were a vernal pool, there's a blanket prohibition of 100 square feet. But um, a lot of this area falls within that, and it's already been been developed. And I'm yeah. not going to push that. I just find it interesting. Um, but I don't have any problems with it. Assuming that's your recommendation, Brent, that we go along with this, I come <coughs> with the Do you fee reduction. I'm going to propose some some tweaking and some modifications. But yes, I believe. I believe the citizens of Raleigh and the commission would specifically be getting some value-added um, activities which would not normally be associated with this project if they just filed for what they wanted to build and where they wanted to, areas they wanted to alter, and then just paid the fee. Um, okay. So. Anybody else? Okay. <laughs> Fun looking at me. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree with the idea of, uh, I mean, what I'm looking at is the major reduction, which is for the previously developed area. And I fully agree with that. All right, do I hear a motion to uh, accept the proposal? The, the waiver request. The waiver request? Sure. Okay. Second. Second. In favor? All in favor? There we go. Yes. Okay, so let me give you the legal ad. Conservation Commission in accordance with the Wetlands Protection Act. Mass General Law 131, Section 40 is amended by the Town of Raleigh Wetlands Protection Bylaw. A public hearing will be held on Wednesday, May 10th, 815, Room 5, Town Hall Annex at 39 Central Street to consider the notice of intent for the application filed by Gerald <coughs> Mandadi, CEO of the Moran Cameron Group, Incorporated. For the proposed construction of 3,100 square foot commercial building, parking area, access driveways, patios, walkways, utilities <coughs> grading, and stormwater facilities within 100 foot of the buffer zone bordering vegetated wetlands and 100 feet of the vernal pool habitat at 101 Main Street, Rowley. Go ahead. Good evening. For the record, John Moran from the Moran Cameron Group. We're here tonight representing Gerald Fandetti for a notice of intent application for the property located at 101 Main Street. Mr. Fandetti's here with me tonight. Uh, also here with me tonight is Mike DeRosa. He had flagged the wetland resource areas out on the property and identified the potential vernal pool. And after my presentation, I'll hand it over to Mike to get into uh, the wetland delineation, the vernal pool, and our mitigation measures proposed. So the plan that you see before you here uh, is the existing conditions. The wetland resource areas and the potential vernal pools are located at the back side of the property. Uh, on the plan set that was submitted, there's actually an existing limit of work maintained area out on the site, which is what we just discussed with regards to uh, the filing fee. And pretty much, you can see the change in the color. We use that to show the distinction between uh, where it changes over from existing maintained lawn and landscape areas over to a natural buffer uh, out on the site. So what we've got out there, you've got two buffer zones. You've got the buffer zone from the wetland and the buffer zone from the vernal pool. So currently in the, the buffer zone from both the vernal pool and the wetland, you've got an existing dwelling out back, an existing gravel drive, which is pretty much impervious. It's been out on the site for a long time. Uh, we actually tried to auger through it. Uh, we couldn't even get through it. Uh, as you may know, under the planning board's regulations, anyway, when you're dealing with drainage, we're required to treat all gravel areas of, as impervious anyway, proposed and existing. So uh, many of you know the country uh, garden and bunch of uh, motel-style buildings out on the site, existing paved and gravel parking areas. 
There's an existing pool out there as well. Pretty much there's actual um, two access ways to get in. There's a horseshoe kind of in and out. Uh, existing pavement goes out to about that part of the property. Then this is all gravel, uh, which again is pretty much impervious based on how long it's been out there. The proposal is we're going to remove the majority of the buildings out on the site with the exception of the front building and the rear existing dwelling on the back. And what's going to happen is we're proposing we're going to close one of the entrances, uh, two-way access coming in, uh, several parking spaces out by a proposed uh, gallery and a spa building. We're going to remove the existing in-ground pool, build another in-ground pool roughly in the same location. Parking area you're out back. Uh, we're actually proposing a 30-room in, 100-seat restaurant that would actually be connected to the existing dwelling that's out in the rear. The existing dwelling out back will be converted over to an accessory use for the restaurant. So also associated with the restaurant, we'll have a series of patios. Uh, a fire pit area, walkways. We actually have to provide fire access around the building. So we've actually got a fire access that runs all the way around the building. In this location, we'll be using the grass pavers. Uh, so it'll actually just look like lawn in here. When we get back in here, we're going to be using gravel. And then again, back to grass pavers. And then actually in this location, it will be paved uh, back through. But as you can see, the dark black line right here is the actual 100 foot from the wetlands, which is the furthest buffer zone out there. So what we've got in the buffer zone will be a portion of a patio, um, portion of that restaurant building, and we're proposing an extension of parking behind the existing dwelling. And what you'll notice there is behind the dwelling, currently there's no parking back in here, but this existing gravel parking area on the downhill side is an existing garage underneath. <coughs> when you drive in, you can pull into the garage here, so they have this large back out area. So we'll actually be removing, you know, some of that gravel that's actually right up against the wet, uh, the buffer zone or against the wetland in this location, right near the 25 foot no disturb. We'll be reverting that back to lawn. Uh, we'll be providing stormwater management as required under the stormwater standards. Currently, the only stormwater management that's out on the site is when they constructed this building several years ago, they actually put in a small uh, underground infiltration system, uh, which there's an existing catch basin out in the, in the gravel parking area, collects the runoff from uh, the abutting property and this gravel area doesn't collect any of the runoff from any of all of this gravel area. That still just runs off sheet flow down into the resource area. So what we'd be proposing, again, within the buffer zone, we'd actually have two discharges from stormwater. Uh, one <coughs> being right up in this location, approximately 75 feet from the edge of the wetland. It would be discharging into that existing maintained lawn area. Uh, within that lawn area, there's a large grouping of mature trees. There's only about two or three trees that we're going to have to take down in that location. We're able to maintain uh, a lot of the existing uh, mature growth that's down in there. One of the things that Mr. Fandetti wanted to do uh, in this development is in the areas where we had the potential of maintaining existing vegetation, uh, he wanted us to try to save anything that was mature so that once this was developed, at least portions of it would look like it was been there you know, for a long period of time with large standing vegetation. Uh, one of the aspects or one of the benefits that we were proposing was just a stone dust pathway four feet wide that would come down to an overlook area, kind of use that burner pool <coughs> as just a nice visual uh, location. Uh, that's when Brent asked me, he said, you know what, I know that it's maintained right up to where you show that limit. Is there any way that you could actually pull that back and give us back uh, that 25-foot no disturb that's currently being maintained? 
Uh, we took a look at it. I told Brent there's no issue with that. The only issue we do have <coughs> is because of the elevations out there, we do have a stormwater structure that's accepting flow from this paved area back here. And the discharge for that, uh, based on <coughs> elevation, we have to st uh, place it right in that existing maintained lawn area. Uh, what we talked to Brent about doing is we'll add some uh, shrubs or vegetation around that to try to hide it. We'll revegetate the rest of this 25-foot uh, no disturb to bring it back. We'll take that overlook area, pull it back, and put it right along the edge of the 25-foot no disturb. <coughs> and again, all that overlook area is going to be is a stone dust pathway so that uh, it'll allow you to walk on it and then just a, like a bench or two benches there. And the reason for um, the additional path, we kind of have two paths coming down. One's got a set of stairs in it, the other one doesn't. So we want to give the ability to somebody that can't do stairs to have, you know, be able to get down there. And that's what, um, why we actually had to do some minor regrading down in this area just to get that, the slope on that path down and make it an even slope all the way down. <coughs> So as Brent had pointed out, all work's in the buffer zone. We have no work in the uh, wetland itself. Uh, we are within the vernal pool buffer. But again, uh, we tried to maintain, to the extent practicable, all work within the previously disturbed areas. The only two locations where we had to um, go beyond that was up in this location, uh, a corner of this pavement right up by the end of the buffer and down in this location where the path to get around that corner without stairs we had to really extend this path out to get the length that we needed to get the slope that we needed for that and to minimize disturbance we're actually putting a retaining wall in there so that we don't have to chase that grade and really do a lot of grading up in that area um, before i hand it over to mike DeRosa, I be more than happy to answer any questions the Commission may have at this time. Uh, I did speak to Larry Graham briefly the other day. Um, he's still doing his review. We have filed for site plan review under the Planning Board. We've also filed a stormwater permit under your regulations, which will actually be heard next. But um, Larry has not finished his review yet. Um, he does not anticipate having his review completed for the Planning Board meeting tomorrow night. Uh, he did say that hopefully he might have some bullet items for us. Uh, with regards, regards to some of his concerns, but as of tonight, we just don't have any comments uh, back from Larry, so we will be requesting a continuance anyway on this project uh, to the next meeting because we don't have Larry's report yet. So at this point, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. I guess the only thought that I have off the top of my head is that, um, and this may well be more appropriate under the next item, <laughs> it seems to me you're adding an awful lot of uh, uh, impervious surface in the form of, of um, parking area and roofing. And, and this doesn't seem, in terms of the sheet runoff you were talking about or the infiltration area, that that might not be sufficient. But anyway, I'll, I'll defer that until the next time. Well, I can even I can address that. I'll address it during both. The one good thing that we have out on the site, the soils are extremely well-drained soils, deep water tables. So if we didn't have that type of soil on this property, we wouldn't be proposing a development like this for this site. We're taking advantage in every location that we can for the well-drained soils. So we have designed a series of um, underground infiltration systems in compliance with the stormwater standards you know, taking advantage of a lot of little things as well. For example, we need a small little lawn drain up in here. Well, that lawn drain is collecting a lot of the runoff from this lawn area. As it's flowing down into our main drain line, we're going to take advantage of the infiltration and actually infiltrate it all along this length. All along this existing fire, uh, the proposed fire <coughs> access, Underneath it, we're going to have a bed of stone with a bunch of perforated pipes in it that are going to serve as another infiltration system. You know, it'll be accepting runoff from the parking lot and the roof runoff from this structure. Uh, for the mitigation, uh, we don't have room to do your standard sediment four bays or pretreatment devices like that, so we're going to have proprietary 
um, storm scepter type devices in the parking lot, you know, for pretreatment that meet the required TSS removal for uh, the runoff associated with the parking lot. As the commission knows, you know, you need 80 percent, well, you need 44 percent removal before you even go into your uh, recharge areas. Uh, these systems, we actually end up with 85 or 90 percent before it even reaches the recharge area. The standard is prior to your discharge, you have to have minimum 80 percent, so we far exceed that. Roof runoff is considered clean. You don't have to pre-treat it before you infiltrate it. This catch basin actually runs to a series of um, infiltration chambers here. Uh, these are not your standard small plastic chambers. These are actually big concrete chambers, so we're taking advantage of the fact that we have very well-drained soils. Um, most of our stormwater systems are actually four and a half, five feet above the water table, or the estimated, well, five feet above the bottom of our test pit, which we didn't have water. The only areas that we actually encountered water was the two test pits that we actually had to come in and get permission from the commission. We originally were thinking of using this depression almost like as a natural ponding area. So that's why we actually did some test pits down in here. Uh, once we got into the design, it was determined that you know using this for a pond just didn't make any sense. And that's when we started going with, we went with the chambers up here, the infiltration along here. And what happens here is this outlet structure actually ties into this outlet structure, minimizes the amount of um, point source discharges that we have. So now the only point source discharges we have is just these two in those two locations. So, uh, yeah, I, I believe the increase in impervious coverage is about 18,000 square feet, which in the grand scheme of things isn't really a lot. But based on the well-drained soils that we have, we could easily uh, handle that. Now, it looks like your hot drop goes right to the boundaries, property yes. boundary. Right. What are you going to do with snow? Hmm. Snow stockpile is it's going to have to be removed off-site. Oh. We can't stockpile it. We just don't have the room. The only spot that we could potentially do it is right in here and well, over in here. But yeah, you've got your blocking, blocking on, there. You're blocking the yeah. uh, fire thing. Well, the fire access is here, so... You know, you can't put it here because you get a, a catch basin or a lawn drain there. You know, you can't really pile it on the walkway. So, pretty much, you've got to be removing snow off the site. There's just no other place to put it. I take it you're saying that the soils are quite sandy? Yes. Okay. Because the fire access isn't a, a real access for vehicles. It's just Right, it, yeah, the fire access is strictly fire department. That's why, you know, in this location we chose to use the grass pavers to get in there because it, it won't even look like an access. Yeah. You know, the fire department will know where it is. Over in here you've got a drop-off area for the restaurant. This serves as like a patio greeting area. And then they'll be able to drive right up onto that path. Right now this almost just looks like an extension of a walkway. It's just oversized. And then again, we just kind of drop back into the grass pavers so that it looks like it's, there's nothing over there. And then we use the gravel along the backside because you can't really see it anyway. Do we have any questions? Yeah. When was the test pits done? When? You went, when, you went. Um, when did we do those? November 2016. And I know you're going to say it was during, there wasn't a lot of water at that point right but there was you know there was zero soil modeling mm -hmm. you know in the test pits i mean these are probably some of the best test pits that i've ever seen i mean it's really nice soil but what we did is i mean pretty much we did 15 we did 11 test pits across the site uh some of them were done for stormwater management some of them were done for septic mm -hmm. Uh, we still need to go back out and do some additional testing for septic because at the time Mr. Fandetti uh, was not in control of the property. We couldn't do any testing in the existing pavement. Uh, as I pointed out, that pavement out in the front is going to actually get removed. We're going to have a septic system there, but we couldn't test exactly where we were going to put the septic, so we're going to need to go back once we start finalizing the septic designs.
but every test pit out on the site, with the exception of the two closest to the wetland, which you'd expect, you know, we were down 10, 12 feet, no water. Somewhere along that stretch of, of uh, Main Street, there was, a, there was a huge area that used to be an old sand pit, so I believed it. It's <laughs> <laughs> right down beyond it. Yeah. Um, the only septic system is going to be up in the front. Where no, we actually have. We're going to have multiple septics. You're going to have a septic system here. All the septics will be outside the buffer zone, but we're going to have a septic system up here that's going to service the gallery spire and the existing structure out front. Um, the inn and the restaurant, which this system will now be part of it, is going to be serviced by one septic system up in here. Oh, the parking lot. Yeah, and reserve area is going to be here. Another reserve area is going to be over here. The reserve area for this system is going to be right next to that one. Sounds like you're thought of everything. <laughs> Except the snow. Right? Yeah, yeah, where, well, where, where are you going to take the snow? <laughs> Don't know that yet. Any other questions? <clears throat> if you want, Mike DeRosa can just go over his um, planting plan and go through it. Yeah, just I think it. I can use the screen. Do you mind if we put it back up? Right? No. Uh, for the record, Mike DeRosa, DeRosa Environmental. Um, <coughs> we're contracted to put together the restoration plan. Um, can you zoom in a little, Brent? Or? can zoom in a little or I can zoom in a lot, but you want the plan, right? Not on you. Well, more down close to the wetland. Yeah, and then slide it over. Yeah, exactly. You can show the plant list. So. There we go. Perfect. That's good. How's that? Yeah, that's perfect. So, as Brent said uh, in his opening, the um, this area is just replete with uh, Japanese knotweed being the primary one, but also Asiatic bittersweet, common buckthorn, glossy buckthorn, um, multiflora rose, honeysuckle, all the usual uh, suspects. We are proposing to use whole plant removal strategies. We don't like using chemicals, so we, we advocate to remove the whole plant. So it's not just the standing vegetation, but it's also the roots as well. And um, we will be doing that. The roots will be either ground on site or and then taken off um, to be uh, composted. The knotweed, we have a special program with the uh, Franklin Park Zoo and we take the harvested knotweed into the zoo and they use it as a uh, forage for the giraffes and the hoof and hornstock. The roots we excavate or treat in place with an organic herbicide. Um, I think in this case, since it is going to be such a construction site, we'll probably be excavating and uh, removing those roots because that's they're tough to get rid of. As you know, knotweed is persistent. Um, the um, area will be graded um, once the invasives are removed, and then we're going to be replanting heavily with a, uh, a native grass mix in the buffer zone. Um, we have a, uh, it's about an eight species native grass mix that we, uh, we use in these areas. Um, and that will be um, spread and irrigated and, uh, and stabilized. There will be a follow-up plan of, of a minimum of two years for the knotweed in particular. But um, invasive removals are never once and done. It's a uh, you know, there is an ongoing maintenance program that will be incorporated into this. Um, we have, for new plantings, we have canopy shrub and herbaceous. Um, we've got Tupelo and red maple and swamp white oak, which will be our, our canopy species. And we've got uh, winterberry, highbush blueberry, elderberry, red osier dogwood for our shrubs. The herbaceous species are, if you could scoot down a little bit, Brent, I can't remember everything we've got here. Um, oh, and witch hazel in the buffer zone as well. Um, and then tussock sedge, soft rush, wool grass, turtle head, and carnal flower. 
all those are very sun tolerant wetland species and we're going to enhance the wetland area as well. Um, so it's a very um, comprehensive restoration plan. Um, I talked briefly with Brent about it today. Uh, we may want to beef up some of the um, buffer zone plantings and the uh, no disturbance zone, um, which we're happy to do. But I think in the end, with a good solid aftercare plan, um, this area will be able to reclaim this area and improve the function and value of the uh, potential vernal pool. We did go out and look twice this spring, and this spring's been a bizarre spring. We had really warm weather early, we had peepers and wood frogs out early, and then it got cold again, everything disappeared. Then a little bit of activity after that. We've not seen any salamander egg masses in here yet. Um, we're still going to be monitoring. Um, we did see some red-eared sliders, which are a predator, um, but that doesn't mean that this area is not functioning as a vernal pool. Um, and it's such an odd year. I was talking to Brian Butler last week, because we're seeing just a, a vastly reduced number of animals this year. And our thinking is that it, the last three years we have bad, bad, bad uh, summer droughts. And we're wondering if that has had an impact on the adult populations of some of our salamanders and, and wood frogs and amphibians. Um, so this is marked as a potential vernal pool on the uh, on natural heritage uh, maps. Um, it has all the characteristics of a vernal pool. We just haven't been able to prove it uh, as yet. But we're going to continue this season. Um, and maybe a couple years before we actually see things uh, coming back. So, but uh, it's a valuable wetland. It's valuable for the development um, and uh, getting rid of all these invasives and putting in a native plant community is going to be uh, advantageous to the development as well as the local ecology. So I can take any questions if there's anything, uh, any other pieces you need to know about. What is a red-eared slider? <laughs> Turtle. Turtle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. You mentioned seeding with native grasses. Yes. Uh, what would be, would it be possible maybe to consider uh, native wildflowers? Yes. And we I do a lot for butterflies, honeybees. Yes. We do a lot for our pollinators. Yeah. Okay. We're actually doing a um, about a half an acre um, pollinator garden for the Ipswich Museum. Good. Plants are coming in next week and we're going to be... That's exciting. Putting, so, yeah, we will incorporate all that. cardinal flower, but... Yeah, cardinal yeah. flower. We'll, we'll incorporate some lupines and things in here. We'll, we'll get a good diversity of things. Good. They need all the help they can get right now. Yes. Any other questions? Let's see if there's anyone in the audience. There. Actually, before one, if you can just scroll back up a little bit. <coughs> Brent, you may recall you had asked me about the stockpile area just upslope of Flag A10. Yep. That's actually, I was talking to one of my surveyors, you may want to go look at that. They think it's actually the old spoils when they dug this pond out. So we may not want to do oh. anything with that. We may just want to just leave that alone. Someone told me they thought it was landscaping. I thought it was. Okay. <laughs> so that was me. I heard it from somewhere. <laughs> so I was mistaken. I was on a different job site. So when I was talking to my surveys, when you and I were out there the other day, I forgot to go take a walk over. So I talked to my surveys about it, and they said, no, they think it's, I mean, if it was landscaping debris, they would have called it something different. So they think it was just Maybe when it's they. It's an Indian burial mound. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> but uh, no, it's just Brent had actually brought it up to me at one point when we were talking about moving that overlook area. He asked me if we were going to be removing that stockpile area. Polygons. Plan. I right. ask what they are. Right, and it says stockpile area. So I just wanted to bring it up and let you know that okay. what it really is is I think it's just an old um, spoils from when they excavated out that pond. And we'll just leave it alone. Well, we got time to check it out. Exactly. <clears throat> Anybody in the audience have any questions? 
Okay, um, I just did a little handwritten uh, sheet that I presented yep. to the, uh, uh, distributed to the commissioners tonight. Um, and mostly because I, I focused first, since I knew this was going to be continued and we hadn't gotten any review from uh, Mr. Graham yet, I figured I'd focus on the proposed uh, mitigation, uh, restor uh, restoration and mitigation plan. I did want to check uh, with Mike. In your plan, you refer to upland mitigation areas, but make absolutely no mention of the buffer zone. And I assume that that's what you actually mean. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, yeah, it's the, it's, to us, it's really to us the, the no buffer zone is not an upland. Yeah. Okay. So. It's usually the no, it's the no disturbance well, zone is what okay. we're focusing no, on. No, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure we were talking about the same, same yeah. things. So we've already talked about what was identified as being a stockpile. We'll have to figure out what that is. <clears throat> um, as, as the commission just uh, conditioned on another project in town, I'm proposing and discuss this with Mr. DeRosa on the phone, uh, that we put a metric into, a condition into the issued order that requires an assessment as to whether the invasive species removal efforts are actually successful or not. With the proposal that we establish two plots that they be measured throughout this two-year monitoring period and that we get empirical evidence that clearly demonstrates that 75% or more of the invasive species component of the site is removed. Otherwise, we continue the <coughs> suppression and, and uh, monitoring for another year beyond <coughs> that if we haven't reached that 75% level. Uh, that was agreeable to Mr. DeRosa, um, yeah. and, and I think it's a good thing to do, especially where, in consideration of the fee waiver, uh, that way we'll be able to uh, demonstrate for sure that the mitigation and the establishment of a native plant community has been uh, successful or not, as, a, as opposed to... So oh, two-year oh, monitoring and yeah. followed by an additional year... If, in fact, we haven't achieved the 75% removal. And that goes hand in hand yeah. with also. Mike's not going to be cocky and say he'll be Reestablishment of a native. <laughs> well, also, there's going to be. Again, this commission also looks. Um, this commission also looks for buffer zone uh, restoration projects to also meet the same criteria because we treat the buffer zone the same as bordering vegetated wetlands, that it's a resource area. So we're going to look at that the buffer zone needs to have the reestablishment of a native plant community that meets the same criteria as a wetlands replication area, yep. that we get a successful um, herbaceous shrub sapling and, uh, and tree layer put back. Um, so, and uh, Mr. Morin already talked about uh, the relocation of that uh, viewing area, which, yeah. And so basically, it's kind of kind of going for trying to establish a 25 foot no cut no disturb but their limit of work also uh, goes out a little further so I think there's a possibility in this evening is the opportunity to have the discussion if we could have a variable width uh, 25 foot no cut no disturbance area so in this area here where the limit of work is up here and planting is proposed in here is there any reason we can't turn this all into a post construction uh, no cut, no disturbance area that has the minimum 25 foot width and just follows the limit of work. Yeah, I can uh, talk to that portions. our client after this. I don't see that it'll be an issue, okay. but I would like the opportunity to talk oh, to them about absolutely. it. Oh, absolutely. I don't see that it'd be. This a is big what deal. the hearing process is for: is yep. for us to broach these topics and and seek to uh, uh, seek to uh, see if we can choose an amenable path. Uh, and this will also help, you know, again, the idea here is that since we've got a vernal pool area there, we really don't want a maintained landscape. I really want to try and establish a vibrant, sustaining natural plant community uh, on there. I also talked about just the ability uh, to, to possibly get a few more uh, plantings to provide you know, some type of uh, vertical strata in these areas here, while at the same time, I think the commission would be amen amenable 
to us possibly having a maintained view corridor there mm -hmm. from that bench overlooked area where we would allow some judicious pruning to keep the viewscape open. But again, the trade-off is also to introduce some vertical strata and not just have her herbaceous cover right in mm -hmm. front of that viewing platform. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there was that, uh, if, if the commission is amenable to that. Um, and also uh, the possibility of putting in a, a post and rail fence as a barrier uh, to establish uh, the no cut, no disturbance area. Uh, because the area is going to go through a transition where from, like I said, from my photographs there going down to the pond, you're almost going to achieve an absolute removal of every single growing thing there by taking out the invasives. And so for a while, there's not going to be, you know, there's just going to be those planted plants and unfortunately it's not going to be a terrain that's necessarily going to say to people, well, you should stop walking here and just look. So putting a fence in will, should be aesthetically pleasing. It should blend in with the historic aspect of the site and it'll also provide a nice solid barrier that basically says to people uh, wanting to walk around that now now when they won't encounter all the thorns of Ro Ragosa Rosa, <laughs> they probably might want to walk through and go down to the pond. So we're just on a kind of yeah. a disincentive to that. <laughs> and that's my suggestions right at this point in time. And okay, but we're not voting on anything tonight. Uh... Continue, sir. No, no, but this gives a chance yep. for everybody to think about what revisions might have to be made and rather uh, the client needs to be contacted about this little change and uh, the nuances for the no cut, no disturbance area. Um, so hopefully you'll be at our next meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that the uh, business mm -hmm. schedule? Yeah. yeah. How deep do you have to go to get out the roots of these invasives? Pardon? On Japanese knotweed, for instance, how deep do you have to it varies. the so soil? It varies. We, we tend to take the majority of it, which is usually at the, at, at the surface or near the surface. We treat it with an organic uh, herbicide called um, Nature's Avenger. And then we do repeat cuttings from there. So on the, if the shoots come up the following year, we do the same thing with Phragmites too, is we do repeat cuttings during the growing season. And what that does, it forces the root ball to use energy to create new shoots. And if we cut them before they start sending out leaves and creating more energy, it reduces the size of that root ball. And then little by little by little, it hits a tipping point, and it, it can't get any more energy from the root and just fails. And in the meantime, the natives are, are occupying that space and taking over that area. I'm a little confused because I hear what you said there and I heard mm -hmm. what you said before it sounded like you were going to scoop all the soil up in those areas and, and we're going to take get the out roots. those roots that way. We're going to take as much of the root as we can. We're not going to get it all. There's just no way. Japanese knotweed grows in clumps, in yeah. very dis discrete, distinct clumps. Mm -hmm. so. But, but it also has the propensity that each of the little rootlets breaking off from yeah. it can create. And just the broken stem will start a new colony. It's insidious, insidious, yeah. <coughs> All right. Very good. So I, with the applicant's permission for a continuance, I would recommend the commission vote to continue this, and then we'll just open up with stormwater management permit. All right. Move for a continuance. So next meeting? Yep. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 When is it, Brent, the next one? Uh, the 30th. 30th. Pretty sure. Let me just check. It's at the bottom of my yep. issue here, I believe. Yes. Yep. May 30th. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me get you to do the notice. Okay. All right, this is a legal notice of the Riley Conservation Commission in accordance to the 
Town of Riley Stormwater Management Erosion Control Bylaw as amended. The public hearing will be held Wednesday, May 10th, 2017, 830 at the Town Hall Annex located at 39 Central Street to consider the stormwater management permit application filed by Gerald Dendeli Dendeli for the proposed construction of various commercial buildings including gallery, spa, guest room, restaurant, parking areas, access drive, patio, walkways, utility grading, stormwater facilities at 101 Main Street, Map 25, Lot 92 in Rowley, Mass. Go ahead. Good evening for the record. John Moran from the Moran Cameron Group. Here tonight representing Gerald Fandetti for the stormwater permit for 101 Main Street. Uh, as we have discussed in the last hearing, pretty much um, the entire site's been designed to mitigate any increase in runoff or quality of runoff created by the proposed development. The system was designed in accordance with the stormwater standards and uh, the Raleigh stormwater standards. Pretty much all existing uh, flow patterns have been maintained. The only thing that we've actually changed is if you look through the drainage report that was submitted, we've actually decreased the amount of runoff that's heading out towards um, Main Street or Route 1A. We knew that uh, Mass DOT would be looking for that anyway, so we took advantage of that. Again, based on the well-drained soils that we have, we had the ability to change this high spot. Um, as I pointed out before, you know, right now you've got a lot of impervious areas that are actually draining back out towards Route 1A. Uh, we were able to reduce that and as I pointed out, actually reduce the amount of runoff heading out to Route 1A. Change or redirect it back in this direct, uh, area, mitigate it, and then mitigate the flows down to, which is the other design point, which is really the wetland. And all flow rates have been mitigated uh, to the wetland resource area. And we actually used the, what is it, Atlas 40? Atlas 14. Yeah, Atlas 14. <clears throat> uh, design flow instead of the standard TR55 uh, stormwater rates. We use the more, uh, the higher flow rates on the Atlas 14 numbers. Uh, total suspended solids um, or TSS removal, as I had stated before, uh, exceeds the minimum 80%. Infiltration rates exceed what's required uh, under the stormwater standards. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that the commission may have. Again, uh, we don't have a report from Larry Graham yet, so obviously we're going to request to continue this. Um, but again, I'll answer any questions the Commission may have. Are you filing for um, uh, EPA? NIPTES permit? NIPTES permit? Yes. Yeah, yeah we'll so be filing that. A, a swab? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> the only other question. I had that I, I saved from the last one. The stormwater discharge over here, because this is a vernal pool, does that get considered that that's outstanding resource waters and you need to treat to a higher level <coughs> of discharge from I that didn't particular point? I didn't see that in the stormwater standards that they considered a vernal pool as an outstanding resource water. Okay, I'm going to check into that just in case. Okay. I, think that I hadn't checked into that either. That just dawned on me as we were talking here tonight. <clears throat> so we're going to uh, ask for a continuance? Yes. Right. It, it, again, the commission uh, allows the applicant to mm -hmm. utilize yeah. the technical consulting services that they engage through the planning board review process mm -hmm. so that we don't get involved with the duplicate effort of competing. Uh, competing reviewers on it, um, <clears throat> unless the commission feels that this project is such a special nature as we had with 414 Haverhill Street that we uh, wish to seek the services of a yep. stormwater consultant. But um, this is an in drinking water supply for the town of Raleigh, so and also the nature of the soils I think actually gives the uh, uh, the applicant here a, a big advantage <laughs> to, ac do. to accomplish now, is that on site a, is that a treatment. Is true vernal pool or does it, <clears throat> does it actually, is there a stream at the back end of that? 
I haven't walked around it because it goes off the property, but usually the criteria for even considering that it be a vernal pool is that it doesn't have it an doesn't. Out outlet that yeah. will serve it, as an inlet a huge for fish. Wetland wetland area. Area. Have you, that, it but that wetland area goes but. like towards Savages because they yeah. have quite a bit of water down yeah. there. Yeah, it's, it's yeah a lot that of must water. be that same area. Yeah. yeah. Well, it actually goes in and probably combines with the wetland system that's just to the north of the Heritage Way, uh, what was originally going to be called Village Green. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that same system. It's entirely possible, though, that because of the nature of the soils here, that there isn't channelized flow leaving from this. It may just be the groundwater working through these very porous uh, I mean, that's old. all sand, I mean, right. cemetery. Right, exactly. So, never, so even, it, never even hit a rock in a cemetery. So it may not, I mean, it may not have an outlet, but it may be just directly connected by the groundwater yeah. to the whole rest of that the so. system. That's a dug pond, though, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, anybody want to make a motion to continue, continue to for the next permission. next meeting, which is the 30th? Second? Second. All in favor? All right. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, when are you meeting with planning? Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Yeah. Good. They have a estimated opening date? We're looking at the fall of next year. Big, big fall. If you guys... Yeah. Yeah. How many beds are there in the old facility versus the new one? Actually, the, the existing facility has 23 one-bedroom units, four really? units that were approved but never built, so now you're at 27, and then the existing dwelling out back has three bedrooms, so you're at 30. So the existing had the ability to have 30, and we're proposing 30. Actually, we're proposing 31 because the building out front has a bedroom in it. If you want a restaurant reservation for 6.30. <laughs> I, love the, I love the proposal. Uh, on, uh, October 2nd. I, I, stayed that, I stayed in that old motel once, and it must have been the worst room in the North Shore. <laughs> well, hopefully the new place will be much more attractive. I'm sure it will be. Good luck for the family. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So the agenda item is for 970 tables. Uh, which is a certificate of compliance request. request from Kevin Capano. It's an administrative item. Yep. And Mr. Carpeno uh, requests that the commission continue this certificate of compliance request to the next meeting. Okay. He still needs to put in the no cut, no disturb posts. Okay. Um, yeah. Very good. So, uh, Brings us to uh, status. Need, need a motion. Oh, we got. Uh, yeah. Do I hear a motion for continuance? So, second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> so that brings us. Mr. To Bell uh, has been waiting patiently oh, yes. to speak to us on 504. New report term pipe, which is an administrative item. So yes. if you just want to read that and uh, see if I can bring up. Is it on there? No. Uh-oh. No, that's right at the bottom. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me read you. Could have been on the agenda I passed out. Well, probably. Is this here? Yeah. Uh, okay. New certificate of compliance, DEP number 63, 586, 504, new report term Map 19, parcel H. Lot 1A, owned by Vernon Bell, the third. Okay. What do we get, Brett? Thank you. We have, I'm going to just pull out. Whoops. Yeah. 
Mr. Bell's site is a, well, a little offset from the Samard's uh, restaurant on Newbury Court Turnpike. Most of what you see is a gravel driveway entrance that goes back into the property. Uh, I don't even remember when, when you started this. Was it 2006 or? Yeah, it was quite a while ago. Yeah, it was a little, a little while ago. Um, so, but anyway, this actually is a situation where there's an isolated a vegetated wetland uh, that uh, Mr. Bell wanted to uh, have gravel access. Uh, he does pool installations and landscaping work, correct? Uh, so he wanted to sort of develop and have his inventory and his vehicles to the back of the property and have access going down through there. We had uh, this isolated vegetated wetland area that receives a lot of runoff uh, from Route 1 and when uh, Mr. Bell put the, uh, his gravel drive in, we put provisions for two 12-inch uh, culverts in there, not because there was any evidence of a consistent flow from this area, right. but we could see that there was a seasonal snow melt, a spring, yeah, a spring pathway with clumps of leaves or whatever, but no real channel right. to make it quote-unquote an intermittent stream or anything. Uh, so we did put those pipes in there, went to the back, and did a bunch of clearing. I'm sorry I don't have the pictures. I guess I forgot to put the pictures in the file uh, that I put on the computer here tonight. Um, but basically he has a boulder retaining wall towards the uh, back of the property. He's installed the no cut, no disturbance markers, which have all been indicated on the plan. Um, he is possibly going to be speaking to us in the future about a little more permanent. He had an aluminum arched canvas structure that lots of times they don't play well with uh, 60 mile per hour nor'easters or uh, real heavy wet snows. So, so he's possibly looking at uh, coming back before us because that work would be in the buffer zone uh, with a little bit more uh, temporary excuse me, a little bit more rigid structure that still is but just secured by sauna posts. And, Whatever. But okay. anyway, that's for the future. Um, all the work's been completed, it's been inspected. The no cut, no disturbance posts are in the way. I believe I did produce a memo uh, for the commission's review. Uh, there are some ongoing uh, conditions that are associated uh, with the property. Some of those were sort of just put in place um, because originally, Mr. Bell was exploring the possibility of putting a single family residence out there. So, so normally we wouldn't necessarily start talking about the fertilizer and, and uh, prohibition against using uh, rock salt, but we did, that, we did that in this situation because we thought in the future and I believe you purchased a tax title property from the town, correct, that abuts this? So, so again, it's entirely possible that in the future, Mr. Bell will be back before us with uh, different proposals for further activity in this area. But for the time being, this initial opening up establishment of the driveway and getting the parking areas and stuff uh, with the retaining wall, that's all been completed and is all stabilized, well grown in. Uh, very nice looking job. Okay. So, so my recommendation, if the commission so chooses, is to issue a complete certificate of compliance with the above stated ongoing conditions. The piece of property you bought is the back of. The uh, it was actually abutting to the side. Off um, to the south, yeah, to the so, north. So yeah, exactly on the north. Um, uh, so we're probably going to do another entrance on that side. Um, you know, when we get to that stage. Um, but for now, everything's it's going good. Thank you. Do I hear such a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I wish I'd known you were sitting there until nice all night. I would have tried to run you through a little early. It was almost interesting, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> After a while, it's not. <laughs> Listen to Saeed backpedal. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, sirs, madam, thank you so much, and uh, have a good evening. You too. Thank, thank you. you. Well, you know, that's kind of funny. 
So the 510 Newbury Court Turnpike property that had the second solar yeah. project proposed thinking. on it, yeah. it was apparently laid out for some type of future subdivision. So it had an access roadway going in from Newburyport Turnpike, and on either side of it, it had two flanking lots, possibly for single-family home development. But it was all tied into this 510 Newburyport Realty Trust or whatever. Apparently, he decided not to continue paying the taxes on those two flanking lots, possibly thinking that they were so small and right with the frontage on Newburyport Turnpike, they, they weren't going to be really attractive for single family home development. I mean, who knows? I could yeah. speculate all night long, but for yeah. whatever reason, the town so, took them for non payment of taxes and then put them up for auction. And Mr. Bell bought the one that's adjacent to this particular lot because right. it's got the access and stuff. Yeah. So that solar panel deal is dead and gone? Well, I, we issued a permit for three years, and if if at whatever point in time they wish to either pay the town's bylaw fee or or enter into the restriction, uh, they could proceed with the project, but uh, I haven't heard of Pete. And of course the one on Central Street is almost like done. Yeah. I mean that's I think it's they're they've got a temporary temporary converter thing in place uh, because the custom one they needed was 10 weeks out, but for all intents and purposes, my understanding is that the wiring and everything is now all complete, so they qualified for their state tax credit or whatever. All right, starting to get late. What do we got? Uh, Mr. Herrick, in status of enforcements? Yes. And uh, he had given me, and he's, I guess, given you also, um, information that he's now hired a... Well, I've been in contact with Thad Barry, his engineer, yep. and also received communications from Bill Manuel of uh, Wetlands Land Management, mm -hmm. uh, both saying they their services have been retained uh, to uh, start putting together a notice of intent application uh, to, uh, to address the uh, floodplain issues for the um, upgrading and an expansion of the farm, the farm crossing. Uh, so that was supposed to have happened with the notice of the 10 application uh, coming in in January. They kind of missed the whole thing and hadn't directed any efforts on it, but now it's uh, apparently a full speed ahead on trying to comply with that. So I think the commission did see the notice of non-compliance that they were sent to them. Uh, sometimes the power of the written word and the slight calculation of what a potential you were a hundred percent fee. <laughs> you were hundred percent. And that was just right. one. Yeah. That was just one of multiple violations yeah. uh, that they technically could have been cited for. But anyway, the it achieved its purpose was it gave them a new incentive to yeah. get an application. So that's underway. I didn't know if you wanted to specifically tell them when you wish to see an application. I mean, the expectation is that we might see it for the 30th, but then again, I'm not, I don't know if I really want to stake my... You know, I think uh, the other... And, and that might be a little I'm bit... I'm under the impression when he gave me this. Because he, he needs to get a surveyor mm -hmm. out there, and surveyors sometimes mm -hmm. take a little more time than... Well, he, they were actually doing a couple projects for him, so he's right. sort of sliding right. right over and doing that. So, but I think... Um, I would assume that our meeting of uh, January, uh, June 20th, that you certainly expect to have received a filing oh, prior yeah. to that meeting. Yes. Definitely. Okay. Yes. All right. So I'll look up what the submittal date is for that, and I'll just communicate that that's the commission. One way or the other, he will be here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. Anything else? Um, no, I don't. I don't believe so. Let me just. So you have motion to adjourn. Yeah. Okay. Can I just make one comment? And I don't know why it came to me tonight, but we used to um, have members of the audience sign in. So we had a record, a record of who was here and presumably why. I sort of think we ought to continue to do that. Um, um, every other board does. Yeah. Every other actually, board. we haven't 
I've got a sheet. Yeah. Actually, we normally, well, like tonight, we really didn't have any of the yeah. butters or anything here. Well, I do have I do have the sheet and a clipboard available yeah, for should, that yeah. purpose. I think we should do that. Most of the people, well, I think everyone that was here tonight was a yeah. staff person except for that yeah. realtor that may have been accompanying. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out who's here for what reason. Well, um, here. yeah, the, the girl that was here, was the, there? Oh, yeah, she yeah. uh, hopefully would join the... Would no, be the other woman here. I yeah. Yeah. Yes, I don't know. That, I believe but she every other meeting I've been to, you she sign in when you come in. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, you must understand, though, that there is no requirement. That is not a requirement. That they sign. The debt, yeah. yeah, no, I can understand. That's <laughs> to totally... Here, I'm motion yeah. to adjourn. Yeah. I'm getting grouped. Yeah. Oh, I, I started out grouchish. Do I hear a motion? A motion. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> See you a second in. Okay. All right. All in favor. All right. Aye. Those are good cookies today. They were. You know the new elevator?